I'm here to tell you a little bit about uh, what you can learn from pottery when you're working with um, really small pieces. Uh, archaeologists find pottery so cool because it can tell us so much about the way people lived in the past from what they were eating to how they were moving across the landscape and the other people that they were interacting with. But we're often challenged by the pottery that we find because we're not finding whole vessels or reconstructable vessels. We're finding small pieces like this. Um, but the work that we do in the ceramic technology lab here really emphasizes all the things that you can learn from pottery. Using the microscope, I'm able to see inclusions that you can't necessarily see with the naked eye. So um, with this pottery in particular, I'm looking for evidence of sponge spicules, which are the, um, they're part of freshwater sponges, the animal, uh, that are found in great abundance in this kind of pottery. If I see sponge spicules here, that tells me that this pottery was likely made from a material that was really high in organics, so things like decaying plants and animals from a watery environment, so like a, a marsh or a swamp. To be a potter is to be an engineer, but it's also to be sort of like a baker. So you're figuring out what the right kinds of raw, in, raw materials are, the raw ingredients, and figuring out the right steps and the procedures to turn this plastic, pliable clay into something human-made, permanent, that's going to be uh, hard. And so um, one of the things that we do here is we look at these, um, we look at the clay resources and we look at the finished pots and we try to reverse engineer pottery to figure out how it was made which then, from that, we can learn who was making it and how it was, was moving across the landscape and how it was um, being um, brought into social and economic relationships in the past. So for example, we might get a sample of clay like this, and we will sort it um, according to grain size in a series of sieves, so we get a bunch of different um, particle sizes from coarse very, very fine. We'll make briquettes out of it and we'll fire those briquettes. And by doing that, we can learn um, the different uh, properties of the clay and how it acts when it's fired. So thinking about how people took a raw material that they dug from the ground or collected from the ground and what they would need to do to transform it to make it something that could make the pots that they were trying to make. So some clays shrink more than others. Um, as they dry. Some of them are going to warp a lot or contort as they're fired in the kiln. Um, some have a lot of other materials in them, some of which may be beneficial and some may not. So uh, potters may have tried to remove some of the ones that were less beneficial and to, um, to keep or even to add in additional materials that were beneficial. These materials that are added are called tempers. The process of tempering is something that enhances the performance characteristics of pottery, so it makes it stronger while it's being made, while it's being fired and turned into a finished vessel, and then for while it's being used. So for things like cooking, you need it to have thermal shock resistance, um, and for other applications, you may want different characteristics. So potters really are just engineering and figuring out these raw materials to see what's going to have the best characteristics for what they need. So in some cases, they were adding materials like Spanish moss, a fiber temper that uh, is going to burn out and leave hollows. Um, sand is something that's commonly found in clays, especially here in Florida, but it could also be added to create um, a body that has good uh, thermal stress resistance. Um, and then there are things like burnt shell, which can be added to pottery as well. Or even you can do the ultimate recycling and grind up pottery into small pieces and add that to clay and fire it again. So pottery made from pottery um, or grog-tempered pottery. So these are um, 
some of the ways that we look at raw materials, but then we also want to look at what we can learn from things that we can't necessarily see with the naked eye. So we do a variety of things from petrography. So with some of these clay samples and with ceramic samples, we'll make pottery thin sections, look at them under the microscope and count the constituents, so what they're made of mineralogically. We can also look elementally and actually see um, with mass spectrometers and with um, nuclear reactors what uh, pottery is made of. So these are samples that have been, each of these is a pottery sample. There are about 40 on each of these microscope slides. And they will go into laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer, um, where we can um, get the elemental analysis on these. And from that, we can learn um, where things were made, which then can tell us um, where, where they were made and where they were found are often two different places. And so that's um, a really great way for us to understand people in pots moving across the landscape in the past.